I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning, everybody. It's Mark the Controversial Christian here. Today we're going to continue with American history. We're going to talk about a man named George Washington Carver. Yes, he was a black man, and he contributed quite a bit to United States history. All right. Let me start with our opening prayer. Then we'll do our reading, and then we'll talk about George Washington Carver. Almighty God, who seest that we have no power our, of ourselves to help ourselves, keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversaries which may happen to the body, and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul, through Jesus Christ our Lord. <sighs> How is everybody today? I'm doing good. March 8th. Yeah, today's the 8th day of March 2021. I don't know if I mentioned that or not, but older I get, it seems the more I forget. <laughs> all right. We know. That's today's reading. We know that all things work together for good. Romans 8, 28, that was. When seemingly bad things happen to good people, it's normal human response to ask why. We long to understand the apparent senselessness of accidents, suffering, failure, or persecution. Our faith can be shaken as we struggle to understand how a loving God could allow bad things to happen. In difficult times, we are privileged to have blessed prom promises penned by the Apostle Paul, but authored in the heart of God. There is no hesitancy, hesitancy in Paul's assertion. Wow, man, I couldn't get that one out. His conviction is firm, born of our lifetime of suffering and persecution. He declares we know. We know deep in our hearts that bad things do not need to be feared. We know this because our omnipotent God is at work behind the scenes bringing good out of what seems bad for every person who claims allegiance to him. Because of the love of God for us, we can be certain that God is at work for the good of his people. Since God is good, the work he is doing for his people is good. The ultimate good towards which he is working in his glorification and the salvation of his children. Life is a grindstone, and whether it grinds a man down or polishes him up, Depends on the stuff he's made of. Hey, hey, that's a good saying. Josh Billings said that. Wow, Josh. That's a pretty good one. Let me get a drink of my coffee here. All right, let's get into George Washington Carver here. All righty. He was a black man. He was an agriculture. George Washington Carver was an agricultural scientist and inventor who developed hundreds of products using peanuts. Though it's claimed that he invented peanut butter, but they say it's not true. But, you know, back then, I don't know if they really kept records as well as they do, but they did do now. But he also, you know, worked with sweet potatoes and soybeans. He was born into slavery a year before it was outlawed. Carver left home at a young age to pursue education and would eventually earn a master's degree in agricultural science from Iowa State University. He would go on to teach and conduct research at Tus Tuskegee University for decades, and soon after his death, death, his childhood home would be named a national monument, the first of its kind to honor an African American. He was born near Diamond, Missouri in 1864. They're not exactly sure whether he was born in January or June. They're not really exactly sure. Nine years prior, Moses Carver, a white farm owner, purchased George Carver's mother, Mary, when she was 13 years old. 
The elder Carver reportedly was against slavery but needed help at his 240-acre farm. When Carver was an infant, he and his mother and sister were kidnapped from the Carver farm by one of the bands of slave raiders that roamed Missouri during the Civil War era. They were sold in Kentucky. Moses Carver hired a neighbor to retrieve them, but the neighbor only succeeded in finding George, whom he purchased by trading one of Moses' finest horses. Carver grew up knowing little about his mother and his, or his father, who had died in an accident before he was born. Moses Carver and his wife Susan raised the young George and his brother James as their own and taught the boys how to read and write. James gave up his studies and focused on working in the fields with Moses. <clears throat> George, however, was frail and sickly child who could not help with such work. Instead, Susan taught him to cook, mend, embroider, do laundry, and garden, as well as how to concoct simple herbal medicines. At a young age, Carver took a keen interest in plants and experimented with natural pesticides, fungicides, and soil conditions. He became known as the plant doctor. To local farmers, due to his ability to discern how to improve the health of their gardens, farm, fields, and orchids. At 11, he left the farm to attend an all-black school in the nearby town of Neosho. He was taken in by Andrew and Martha Mariah Watkins, a childless African-American couple who gave him a roof over his head in exchange for help with household chores. The midwife and nurse, Mariah, imparted on Carver her broad knowledge of medicinal herbs and her devout faith. Disappointed with the education he received at Neoshell School, Carver moved to Kansas about two years later, joining numerous other African-American Americans who were traveling west. For the next decade or so, Carver moved from one Midwestern town to another, putting himself through school and surviving off domestic skills he learned from his foster mothers. He graduated from Minneapolis High School in Minneapolis, Kansas in 1880 and applied to Highland College in Kansas. He was initially accepted at the all-white college but was later rejected when the administration learned he was black. <laughs> oh, man. They even had segregated colleges back then, too. In the late 1880s, Carver befriended the Mil Milhollands, a white couple in Win Winterset, Iowa, who encouraged him to pursue a higher education. Despite his former setback, he enrolled in Simpson College, a Methodist school that admitted all qualified applicants. He initially studied art and piano in hopes of earning a teaching degree, but one of his professors, Etta Budd, was skeptical of a black man being able to make a living as an artist. After learning of his interest in plants and flowers, Budd encouraged Carver to apply to Iowa State Agricultural School, now Iowa State University, to study botany. George Washington Carver makes black history. In 1894, he became the first African American to earn a Bachelor of Science degree. Impressed by Carver's research on the fungal infections of soybean plants, his professor asked him to stay on for graduate studies. He worked with famed mycologist, that's a fungal scientist, L.H. Pommel at the Iowa State Experimental Station, honing his skills in identifying and treating plant diseases. In 1896, he earned his Master of Agriculture degree, immediately received several offers, the most attractive which came from Booker T. Washington, whose last name George would later add on his own, of Tuskegee Institute. Carver's early years at Tuskegee were not without hiccups. For one, agricultural training was not popular. Southern farmers believed they already knew how to farm, and students saw schooling as a means to escape farming. Additionally, many faculty members resented Carver for his high salary and demanded to have two dormitory rooms, one for him and one for his plant specimens. He also struggled with demands of the faculty position he held. He wanted to devote his time to researching agriculture for ways to help out poor southern farmers. But he was also expected to manage the school's two farms, teach and share the school's toilet and sanitary facilities, work properly, and sit on multiple committees and councils. Carver and Washington had a complicated, relation, had a complicated relationship but would butt heads often. In part because Carver wanted to do Little to do with teaching, though he was beloved by his students. 
Carver, Carver would eventually get his way when Washington died in 1950 and was succeeded by Robert Rusa Morton, who relieved Carter of his teaching duties except for summer school. What did George Washington Carver invent? All right. By this time, Carver had great success in the laboratory and the community. He taught poor farmers they could feed hogs acorns instead of commercial feed and enrich crop lands with swamp muck instead of fertilizers. His idea of crop rotation proved to be most valuable. Though his work on soil chemistry, through his work on soil chemistry, Carver learned that years of growing cotton had depleted nutrients from the soil, resulting in low yields. But by growing nitrogen, fixing plants like peanuts, soybeans, and sweet potatoes, the soil could be restored, allowing yield to increase dramatically when the land was reverted to cotton a few years later. Wow, that's pretty good. To further help farmers, he invented the Jess Jessup wagon, a kind of mobile classroom and laboratory used to demonstrate soil chemistry. The George Washington Carver, they called him the peanut man. Farmers, of course, loved the high yields of cotton they were now getting from Carver's crop rotation technique. But the method had an unintended consequence. A surplus of peanuts and other not cotton products. Carver set to work on finding alternative uses for these products. For example, he invented numerous products from sweet potatoes, including edible products like flour and vinegar and non-food items such as stains, dyes, paints, and writing ink. But Carver's biggest success came from peanuts. He had only developed more than 300 food, industrial, and commercial products from peanuts, including milk, Worcestershire sauce, punches, cooking oils, salad oil, paper, cosmetic, cosmetics, soaps, and wood stains. He also experimented with peanut-based medicines, including antiseptics, laxatives, and goiter medications. It should be noted, however, that many of these Suggestions or discoveries remain curiosities that did not find widespread applications. In 1921, he appeared before the Ways and Means Committee of the U.S. House of Representatives on behalf of the peanut industry, which, he's, which was seeking tariff protection. Though his testimony did, did not begin well, he described a wide range of products that could be made from peanuts, which not only earned him a standing ovation, but also convinced the committee to approve a high protected tariff from the common legume. He then became known as Peanut Man. The last two decades of his life, he lived as a minor celebrity, but his focus was always on helping people. He traveled the South to promote racial harmony and traveled to India to discuss nutrition in developing nations with Mahatma Gandhi. Up until the year of his death, he also released bulletins for the public. Some of the bulletins reported on research findings, but many others were more practical in nature and including cultivation, cultivation information for farmers, science, and teachers, and recipes for housewives. In the mid-30s, when the polio virus raged in America, Carver became convinced that peanuts were the answer. He offered a treatment of peanut oil massages and reported positive results, though no scientific evidence Exists that the treatments work. The benefits the patient experienced were likely due to massage treatment and attentive care rather than the oil. He died January 5, 1943, at Tusky Institute after falling down the stairs of his home. He was 78 years old. He was buried next to Booker T. Washington on the Tusky Institute grounds. Wow, he was pretty interesting. I gotta just say one other thing before I uh, close here. I was we got all this, you know, to talk about racial tension, all this in the world. I was watching a guy yesterday, and uh, Fox News. He was a black man. I think his name was Jason. I can't remember what his last name was. But he said something very interesting that people should really listen to. He said. That politicians now are passing laws of, on people's feelings, you know, what they're feeling, like they're feeling that, you know, there's racism against them or whatever. He said instead of passing laws to benefit all of people, he says, 
they're just passing laws to benefit a few. And he says the research really don't don't warrant, you know, stuff like that. He said laws should be passed to help all people, not just, you know, this one or that one. They should be helped to pass all people. He said because the amount of racism in the world is very minute and with people, you know, trying to bring it out and crying about it like that, he said it's just going to make it worse. You know, and that really made sense to me. I can't remember all of everything he said, but he was a pretty smart man. His name was, I believe his first name was Jason. I can't remember what his last name was. But anyways, he made a lot of sense. All right, here's our closing prayer. Two things I recognize in myself, Lord. I am made in your image. I have defaced that likeness. I admit to my default, to my fault. But remember, Lord, by myself, I cannot do much about it. Take from me what I have spoiled. Leave me in what in what you have made. Amen. Excuse me. Amen, everybody. This is Mark, the controversial Christian, signing off for today, saying we love you, and we hope you have a blessed day.